Like The Legend of Heroes trails through Daybreak, East Tin Nordics represents a somewhat different direction for Falcom. The former leveraged the developer's new proprietary engine to freshen the series formula, while the latter seemingly pursues the same path. There's a sense of trying to depart from a successful formula to embrace something different. It's understandable, after all, where can Adol, the former Crimson King, and Rebel against the Lacrimosa really go next? As it turns out, back to the past. East 10 is set between East 2, Ancient East Vanished, and East 3, Memory of Celseta, with Adol, Dogi, and Dr. Flair traveling through the Obelia Gulf on the Atomus. The ship is accosted by a faction of Normans, known as the Balta Sea Force, who provide safe passage to all vessels through the bay and demand a heavy price, which the Atomus captain skimped out on. The ship is taken to Karnak, where Seaforce has a heavy presence, and the trio are stuck until further notice. Of course, as is often the case in East, there are myths of the Sea King's throne and mysteries revolving around immortal creatures called Griger. It's not long before Karnak is raided by a group of Griger, who are looking for a suitable vessel. With the townspeople kidnapped, it's up to Adol and his new ally, Karja Balta, of the Seaforce to save them fight back against the Griger, and ultimately determine why they're linked by a strange force called Mana. <laughs> and by linked, I mean physically. Due to mysterious circumstances, just a girl's voice in a seashell asking for Adol's help, no biggie, the two are bound by mana cuffs and can't stray far apart. While this leads to some hilarity, which thankfully isn't overplayed, it causes Adol's fate to become intertwined with the Seaforce and Norman culture. Though it takes longer to get going than East 9, Monstrum Nox, East 10 opens up into a compelling mystery as you get to know the people of Karnak, the Balta Seaforce, and Trident, the big three generals of the Griger. The characterization doesn't stray too far from the norm, whether it's the mayor's son Grin, who is desperate to prove himself, the sultry yet quick to anger Yolds Donson, or Grimson, Karja's charismatic father who keeps an emotional distance yet relies on her skills. Commander Gulliver and the rest of the militia made every effort to kill those wolves and keep the roads blocked. But there's only so much we can do when we're constantly understaffed. The whole squad's exhausted. Each of us barely gets any time off. And it's all because you caved into the Normans and slashed our budget! As cliche as some can be, many are well-rounded and developed suitably. Karja is undoubtedly the star, who goes from imposing and callous to developing a sisterly bond with Adol. I appreciated their chemistry, including fighting back as a trio of so-called famous pirates. But dialogue exchanges boiled down to, quote, we should be on our guard, did feel repetitive. At least Karja's reactions to Adol taking on every side quest and exploring every mystery and adventure are humorous enough. Does the placement of the title in the series' canon make it odd since it's never really referenced in future games? Well, sure, but it's the least of East 10's problems. While the storytelling and characterization feel familiar, East 10 Nordics makes radical changes with its combat system, world design, and exploration. Due to the mana cuffs, Adol and Karja can utilize the new cross-action system. Gone are the days of multi-character parties. Instead, you have a duo, where Adol is the fast striker and Karja is the heavy hitter. You can switch between them at any time, and not only does this have the benefit of restoring SP to your partner, who will attack enemies on their own, but also regenerates their health. So they have unique abilities and elements. Adol employs fire for burning branches, Karja creating ice platforms to reach greater heights, the big new feature is simultaneous attacks with both characters. This drastically increases your attack output and allows for utilizing new duo skills, which can deal massive damage. Duo mode is also necessary to shield against and parry unblockable attacks. Time parries correctly, and you not only cause an enemy to stumble, leading to a powerful counterattack, but can also trigger a slick double team move with its own cinematic. You also eventually unlock Revenge Gauge, which is built up by blocking damage and can significantly increase the damage of your next duo skill. So yes, Flash Guard is no longer a thing, and dodging, outside of holding down the button to avoid blue-tinged attacks from enemies, is less vital than parrying. It's a pretty huge shift, and one that takes some getting used to. 
Some skills, especially the rising slashes, feel worthless, and it's often more practical to attack in duo mode than solo, though some situations will see either character going off on their own to explore and fight. It's not the responsiveness or the feel of the combat that I have a problem with, but some fights, especially bosses, boil down to parrying and building up that revenge counter to unleash a powerful duo skill. If a boss has a break gauge, you'll opt to utilize a duo skill more suited to depleting it to render them vulnerable. Rinse and repeat, though there are some exceptions. Lowering the difficulty allows for freer combat tactics, but if you're not a fan of parrying attacks, even if they're easy to execute, then East 10 may struggle to enthrall you. At least the customization feels fresh, with a new skill tree incorporating some aspects of Trail's Orbments with its node linking, which unlocks passive bonuses depending on the mana seeds slotted in and even changes the nature of some attacks. Being able to freely mix and match passives, trading off some benefits for others, felt nice, even if the early benefits didn't feel all that significant. The other major change is that instead of large, seamless zones to explore on foot like East 9, players sail the gulf on a ship, the Sandrus, and explore various islands. The latter can be pretty linear, with a few optional paths to explore, though the new mana string and mana board make for some fun traversal. The dungeon design is also somewhat spruced up thanks to the latter. However, the sailing can initially feel mundane, due to the Sandrus' slow speed and painfully long recharge time on boosts. It can also make ship battles feel excruciating, especially when trying to catch up to opposing vessels to slow them with basic cannon shots before unleashing an EX armament for the kill. Things improve significantly as more upgrades, including special ammo like rapid shots and flaming projectiles that build up burn damage, and skills like mana sail are unlocked. The air currents on the ocean also afford more opportunities for quick traversal and various locations. Even points of interest provide multiple fast travel spots. Combat also gets better as you ram into other ships and board them to engage in wave battles and looting. Other activities like spotting marine wildlife, locating precious cargo, tuna fishing, and much more are also available, alongside side quests to rescue townspeople and liberate areas captured by the Greiger. The latter is similar to the beast hunts from East 8, as the player must destroy several barrier pillars and defeat enemy ships, ultimately making landfall and capturing the location on foot. Different crew members lend unique bonuses during this, from reducing damage taken to infinite dash charges. It does get monotonous and brings back memories of the hostile takeovers from Skull and Bones, though the actual infiltration and tearing through enemies can be fun with worthwhile rewards. Rounding all of this off is the presentation. Falcom's new engine is a marked improvement over previous titles, especially in character models, facial animations, and environmental textures. However, there are some moments, like a dungeon's mundane palette or the external look of islands before boarding them, where the visuals can feel a little underwhelming. Though not terrible, the increased scale may have spread the visual fidelity a little thin. On the bright side, I didn't face any performance issues and the music is a solid mix, even if it pales next to East 8 and 9. As for the voice work, everyone turns in good English performances, though Adol's voice can grate at times. At least his Japanese voiceover still sounds very good. East 10 Nordics is an interesting title for me. Despite thoroughly enjoying East 8 and 9, I went in enthused about a new battle system, sailing and exploration aspects, and came out enjoying but still feeling slightly unsure about each. There's no shaking how much it feels like a step down from its predecessors. However, it is an enjoyable action RPG experience with likable characters, an intriguing story, and some fun activities. And that'll be about it for this one. If you guys like what we're doing at Gaming Bolt, please consider subscribing to our channel, and I'll see you guys on the next video.